Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute uh, pleasure to uh, welcome you all to the Bose Museum tonight, um, and a particularly warm welcome to the trustees of the Sir Dennis Mann Foundation, uh, to Suzanne Marriott, and to Alan Bryant, who are with us tonight. Um, and I would have wanted to extend that welcome to uh, Orietta Bonacci Adam. Um, because she's been equally instrumental in bringing the foundation and the museum together, but sadly she can't be with us tonight. Let me first introduce myself. My name is uh, Peter Mothersill. I'm chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Bose Museum. And for those of you who've not been here before, um, let me just give a little bit of background to the, to the museum. The museum was the, the brainchild of uh, an extraordinary couple, John and Josephine Bose and it opened its doors to the public in 1892. Together, the couple had built up the greatest private collection of fine and decorative arts in the north of England. Um, and they constructed this wonderful building to house them all in. The collection contains thousands of objects, including furniture, paintings, sculpture, ceramics, textiles and many other items covering an extensive range of European styles and periods. Sadly, neither survived to see their vision become reality. And in a similar vein, I think it's sad that for some of our guests tonight who've come from slightly further afield, uh, you may not have had the opportunity to see the magnificent exterior of the building in daylight hours set in beautiful parkland within the rural splendour of Barnard Castle and the surrounding dales. So uh, I can only exhort you to come again when the, uh, the days are longer and the weather might be a little bit more clement and you'll see it in all its glory. It's also, I think, I think it's fair to say that for those of you um, who've again come from slightly further afield and have gone through the somewhat tortuous experience of getting to us here, um, you'll not be surprised that the museum um, has in the past been accorded the title of Hidden Jewel of the Northeast. But you only have to look at the visitor's book or at the, for example, at the comments in, on TripAdvisor to see that once we get people through the door, they're absolutely blown away by the quality and variety of the permanent collection. But it, the collection, demands a larger and a more diverse audience from as wide a geography as possible. And one of the principal ways to uh, achieve this and to extend our reach is to provide an exceptional complementary exhibition program. And we couldn't do this without the support and the generosity of organisations like the Sir Dennis Malm Foundation, who have devoted the energy, commitment and funding to make this collaboration work. Looking at the exhibition, there, there's, there's something of the whole um, being so much more than the sum of its parts when we firstly can marvel at the bringing together of these jewel-like works from the Foundation, the National Gallery, the Royal Collection, centering on Guido Reni's death of Lucretia acquired by John Bowes in 1840. And secondly, on, on a completely different plane, when we can take the themes raised in the exhibition and explore them in the context of today. Since the Renaissance, Lucretia has been an enduring subject for artists, including Botticelli, Dura, Raphael, Gentileschi, who saw her as a symbol of feminine virtue, having taken her life after her rape by Sextus Tarquinius. The themes of physical and sexual abuse, mental health issues arising from feelings of hopelessness and despair, suicidal tendencies, particularly among young adults, are demonstrably as relevant today as they were in 500 BCE in ancient Rome. And clearly, by their deeply um, distressing personal nature, these are difficult and challenging issues to explore and to get involved with. But nevertheless, I'm absolutely clear that it's fundamentally important to raise public awareness and understanding. 
So in parallel with the exhibition, we are encouraging people through debates and in conversation events to engage with the themes highlighted in the exhibition through local artists, community groups and workshops for schools. At the same time, we're celebrating the creative genius of the, of the works in the exhibition with gallery talks, lectures, a film screening, dance workshops and a display of costumes inspired by the exhibition created by the Northern School of Art, which uh, I hope you can see in the Fashion and Textiles Gallery tonight. So a hugely varied programme of events. And if that isn't enough, I'm delighted that tonight we have the opportunity to listen to one of Handel's most famous cantatas, La Lucrezia. Maintaining a fascination with the subject, which continues through to Benjamin Britten's opera in 1946. So I do hope tonight that we'll, that we'll be stim a stimulating and a rewarding occasion for all of us, and that you'll thoroughly enjoy the cantata, I'm sure, and the exhibition, which you'll hear a little bit more about from Dr. Howard Coots in a minute. But first, I'm delighted to hand over to Suzanne Marriott to tell us a little bit more about Sir Dennis and the Foundation. Thank you. Sir Dennis Mann, who passed away in 2011, aged 100, embodied the very best of the scholarly and aesthetic sensibility and his was a life of great integrity, scholarly tenacity and dignity. As a celebrated and renowned art historian and connoisseur, he combined a vigorous interest in the encouragement and the promotion of public education in the arts. Sir Dennis was also a pioneer in the rediscovery and the re-evaluation of a neglected indeed occasionally despised period of art history being Italian Baroque art. He quickly became the world authority in the field, specialising in particular in the work of Guicino and amassing an extraordinary collection of art from that period. One of his most celebrated purchases was Guido Reni's The Rape of Europa, which is now of course placed with the National Gallery of London. His art collection, which he initiated in the 1930s, is without parallel as a specialist private collection of Italian Baroque art and was given on his death to various galleries as a gift to the nations of England, Ireland and Italy. He also campaigned tirelessly in the UK for galleries to benefit the public by opening without any charge. Sir Dennis had a particular passion for Guercino, Nicholas Poussin, and was a leading scholar of Caravaggio. He wrote in a vigorous yet elegant style and was known as a leading authority on these artists. His legacy to us all is maintained through the establishment of his charitable trust, the Sir Dennis Mann Foundation, which continues his research, promotion of his collection to the general public, and support of young and up-and-coming artists. For example, he endowed a prize at the Royal Drawing School, formerly the Prince of Wales's Drawing School, which is awarded to a graduate who has excelled in their drawing studies, a skill which is sadly lacking in all contemporary art courses, and which the Prince of Wales has sought to re-establish through his own charity of the Drawing School. Other initiatives include supporting smaller museums and galleries, organising exhibitions and supporting the private causes which were close to Sir Dennis's heart during his lifetime and promoting scholarship in the 16th and 17th century art, but also in other areas which were of interest to Sir Dennis. It is a tribute to the rigorous standards that he set himself in scholarship that his foundation runs the Sir Dennis Mann Essay Prize for young graduates. Our first winner, Dr Edward Payne, who is here with us tonight, presented his lecture at the Courtauld Institute of Art in 2012. And you can read his winning essay, Hung, Drawn and Tortured, Violence in Drawings by Guercino and Ribera, in the Lucrezia Catalogue, 
which was published in 2013 and which you will receive a copy of tonight. This year's prize will be presented at the end of November at the National Gallery in London and Dr Edward Payne is one of our judges. Sir Dennis would have been very excited to see this wonderful exhibition on display here, The Power and Virtue, Guido Reni's Death of Lucrezia. And Guido Reni was, of course, one of his most loved artists. And if he was with us tonight, he would recall memorable times and discoveries together with his students and scholars of this great artist. On behalf of the Sir Dennis Mann Foundation, I do wish to thank the museum's chairman, Mr. Peter Mottisil, Dr. Howard Coots, Bernadette Petty, Alison Nicholson, Catherine Dickinson, and all of the staff at the Bose Museum for organizing this wonderful exhibition, which the Sir Dennis Mann Foundation is very pleased to support on Sir Dennis's behalf. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Director and Trustees of the Bose Museum, I should like to welcome you to the museum and thank you for your generous sponsorship for our exhibition, The Power and the Virtue, Guido Reni's Death of Lucretia. The curator organiser of the exhibition, Bernadette Petty, is currently away on maternity leave. It is a great honour for us to be associated with the Maran Foundation an eminent art historian whom I have known of since my student days in Cambridge in the 1970s. It has been my great privilege to work at the historic Bose Museum for over 20 years with its wide-ranging collections that cover all fields of fine and decorative art in the period before 1900. The exhibition, The Power and the Virtue, looks at one of the lesser known paintings in our collection, a version of the painting Lucretia by Guido Reni, which was bought in 1840 by John Bowes for 14 guineas before his marriage, a time when he was building up a gentleman's collection of old master paintings. We present it here, newly researched, in an exhibition showing similar depictions of his historic and religious female virtue by Reni, and of course, a major painting by Guecino, lent by the Sir Dennis Mann Foundation. These were interpret for subject matter and artistic significance, somewhat at variance with its interpretation in 1843, when it hung in John Bowes's father's country house of Gibside near Newcastle, and a visitor mistook it for a family portrait. We, we know of this from a letter from his father-in-law, Sir William Hart, that's John Bowes' father-in-law, when he wrote to him from Gibside, I was showing Watson, that's the local doctor, the pictures all over the house a few days ago to his great illumination. He stopped opposite Lucretia and evidently noticed it with due interest. And at last he said, was that lady with the poignard, sir, one of the family? Anyway, in time, John Bowes's early and later purchases got subsumed into his wife Josephine's museum project, started in Paris in 1862, more famous for its Spanish paintings and decorative arts. Over recent years, we have begun to look at the history and range of our collections in more detail, finding many items and themes of interest for a new generation of scholars and public. Our extensive archives gives many details of paintings acquired and some not acquired that have recently become the focus of a number of academic research projects. Beyond that, we seek to involve the community in the appreciation and interpretation of our historic collection who add a present day element to the understanding of these images. Thank you. Good evening. 
It's a great honour to be here on the occasion of this evening's performance of Handel's La Lucrezia Cantata. My name is Saskia Rubin and I'm a former winner of the Sir Dennis Mann Essay Prize. This evening I'm somewhat daunted to be filling the illustrious shoes of Orietta Bonacci Adam, a formidable trustee of the Sir Dennis Mann Foundation. This is not the first time that a party has been thrown for Lucretia, a party in canvas and coloratura. In 2013, Sir Dennis Mann's painting of Lucretia by Guercino was put in dialogue with Handel's musical celebration of the same heroine. Francesco Gonzalez, a collaborator of the Sir Dennis Mann Foundation, initiated this wonderful pairing in the context of an exhibition at the Foundling Museum in London. This historic institution holds two important manuscripts of Handel's Lucrezia Cantata as part of its Gerald Koch Handel collection. It is our pleasure to welcome members of the Amade players to the Bose Museum to perform Handel's Cantata once again. La Lucrezia was composed in Italy for the Marquis Francesco Ruspoli, who employed the composer intermittently between 1707 and 1709. As with all of the cantatas composed for the Marquis's court, La Lucrezia is scored for soprano and basso continuo. The soprano incarnates the Roman noblewoman herself, following her rape by Tarquin. In a flurry of passage work and breathy recitatives, she seeks vengeance from the gods for Tarquin's crime and announces her own suicide by dagger. As we shall hear, Lucretia's individual vision of justice involves lava, ruins, and the arrows of Jupiter. Likely spurious, but juicy nonetheless, is the rumor that Handel's subject for La Lucrezia arose from an affair with the Florentine prima donna Lucrezia d'André. While this theory was debunked in the 60s by musicologist Ursula Kirkendale, there are some things pertaining to this piece that we know to be true. It is undeniable that Handel has mastered the potent musical affects of his time. While the likes of Rainey and Guercino may express Lucretia's agony through a strategically placed dagger and sorrowful eyes that glisten heavenward, Handel closes his cantata with the heart-wrenching Gia nel seno comincia. Here, the eerie Baroque topos of the descending chromatic scale, which can only mean lamentation, inches down and then up again, set, as a, set against a series of mesmeric chords that prolong the agony of the heroine's ultimate sacrifice. And without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce members of the Amade Players, directed by Nick Newland, with Eleanor Ross as the soprano. Thank you.